Hello, this is uh, John Baugh, your professor for um, C++ for the summer 2014. The uh, material that you'll need for the course is available on oaklandcc.edu, which you've probably uh, determined already if you're watching this video. You've probably entered uh, distance learning and uh, desire to learn login. All of the material, including everything you turn in and everything I will assign, and supplemental materials will all be available uh, through Desire to Learn. So if we were to log uh, into Desire to Learn, um, we will notice that across the top you will have different options for different courses that you can um, enter. Um, this is the Object Oriented C++ course. Um, I already put a welcome and also instructions on how to download Visual Studio 2012 Professional. That's the integrated development environment that we'll need in order to uh, uh, work with the materials for the course. Um, also your assignments as I post them will be available under Dropbox and there may be some stuff under quizzes at some point. Um, I'll let you know. Uh, programming assignments will go under Dropbox uh, for sure. So, Under Content Content there's the syllabus available here and then the Lecture 1 materials. Also the video will be available here after I get done recording it. I'll post it. Alright, so uh, this course is CIS 2252. It's C++ programming. Um, it is equivalent to usually the first uh, level course at a university. Uh, so it does have a, a lot of material in it. Uh, however, the general course information is uh, uh, we will meet online except for the midterm. The midterm we will um, arrange, I'll arrange times for the midterm for you to come in in person or if you do not live anywhere near or just absolutely can't work something out then we will try to get something uh, arranged for you uh, through Proctor. So. Uh, don't be, you know, too alarmed or frustrated. So, um, so it will be online. The lectures and materials will be uploaded each week by Friday. I usually will try to get everything in by Tuesday, uploaded by Tuesday, of each week. Um, we meet online. Okay, so a lot of you have been emailing me a little bit confused about uh, what we actually do with an online course, but really what you're doing is you're you're basically just watching the lecture at your own leisure. You're not um, required to be online at a particular time. Um, I'm John uh, Philip Baugh and I'm one of the four full-time instructors here on the Orchard Ridge campus. I have a master's degree in computer science from the University of Michigan Dearborn and I'm currently working on a PhD in information systems engineering. Um, I worked as a research assistant at U of M um, in the Vehicular Networking Systems Research Laboratory under Dr. Jinhua Guo. And uh, once I graduated with my master's degree, I was hired immediately into uh, Siemens PLM Software in Ann Arbor, where I worked for just under five years before I was uh, contacted uh, and offered the job here. Uh, my office is room F117. Uh, F building in obviously the Orchard Ridge campus. My office hours are Tuesday uh, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. and then Wednesday 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. This is actually an online office hour right here. Okay, so that's an online office hour. The office hours are subject to change and uh, my email address uh, for example is uh, jpbaugh at oaklandcc.edu um, I also uh, need to uh, make a point that I won't. I will not be in my office on Wednesday um, every week. Like for example, tomorrow I will not be in my office. But generally, I may be in my office during the early part of the day Wednesday. It kind of depends on what happens. But Tuesday, I'm definitely in from uh, two to five p.m. So if you have any uh, problems and you want to come in and see me in person, uh, you can come in during those times or in some scenarios we can arrange something else. Uh, the course objectives. The student should have a basic understanding of general programming concepts and techniques required prior to enrolling in the class. That is not necessarily a hard requirement if you've never had any programming before 
um, as long as you have decent uh, algebra skills and relatively good uh, skills with basic basic logic, um, then you should be okay. So I wouldn't wouldn't sweat it if you don't have any programming. It's no big deal. Students will be instructed in syntax and semantics of the ANSI C++ language. Topics covered include control structures, arrays, pointers, strings, dynamic memory management, class definition and object-based development, file input-output, overloading, exception handling, and template libraries. Students will be required to complete computer-based assignments inside and outside of class. Again, the prerequisites, you should have an elementary should have elementary algebra skills and be familiar with both elementary word processing and Windows files management techniques prior to enrolling in the course. The textbook for the class is the book by Didel and Didel, uh, father and son team who write quite a few books. Um, it's the C++ How to Program 9th edition from Pearson. Um, you don't uh, technically need the newest version if you can't if you're if finances are a struggle or you just can't find it or wherever you are or, or what have you the eighth edition could suffice um, because we're not doing stuff directly out of the book it's basically uh, mostly slide driven but to look at the corresponding information the ninth edition is the best edition available right now the topics that will be covered will include basic computer architecture introductory programming concepts, classes and objects, strings, control structures, functions, pointers, templates, file processing, and the STL. The website, as you've probably learned already, is Desire to Learn. Uh, this will include the PowerPoint uh, slides, the class announcements, course syllabi, uh, test dates, handouts, and other information. For email, all students need to have an email account, an official email through oaklandcc.edu. Student emails um, have an at uh, student.oaklandcc.edu. Instructors and staff have just at oaklandcc.edu. Um, you need to use your official email while corresponding with me. Please don't use Gmail or Yahoo or private emails. Uh, it gets very, very confusing when people email me and they ask me for help they just say something generic like, hey, can you help me on project one? Um, and they don't identify themselves or what class they're in. And it's <clears throat> the email is, uh, address is spicytwinky97 at yahoo.com. That's not going to help me. Uh, so you need to use the official email uh, account. And since I'm teaching more than one course here, you should identify the class uh, that you are contacting about. So you would say CIS2252 or say C++ programming class. Um, either of those would be helpful. For grading and evaluation, uh, Project 1 is worth 100 points. Uh, project 2 and 3, Projects 2 and 3 are worth 125 points each. Capstone is 200. There is a midterm examination worth 100 points. And then optional other homework, this will vary depending on whether I think you need it or not, um, or if it would be useful uh, for uh, learning in the class, I will maybe assign small homework assignments um, every week, two weeks, three weeks, it depends. So um, they will generally be quite quite small and they might be worth 10, 15, 20 points, 25. It depends on what the scope of them are. Okay, so the um, grading scale is uh, pretty typical. 95 to 100 is an A, 90 to 94 is an A minus, etc., etc. Anything below 60 is an F. Uh, don't shoot for this area. It's not a not a good uh, goal in life, um, and for this course. So pr uh, the projects and the homework. I have four programming projects, which includes one capstone project to grow your skill at programming and problem solving. Um, one thing to note is you do have the four projects. You do have a midterm and some homework, but there is no final. Uh, since this is a project-based course, this is a course where I'm more concerned with you producing good quality code and code that works, code that is well debugged, rather than just regurgitating a bunch of uh, facts and figures, um, I don't have a final. But there is a midterm, so there are things you should know and should commit to memory for sure. There's no way around that if you're going to be a programmer or if you're going to succeed in this class. But I'm more concerned with the... Um, uh, project-based application practicum. 
So uh, submitting homework and late penalties, my official policy is right here. Basically, 5% deduction applied every day that the assignment's late. They uh, have to be uploaded to D2L by 11.59 p.m. of the uh, due date. Um, after five business days, I reserve the right to consider the assignment no longer accepted. The capstone, now I'm going to say this very clearly here because I've had a couple of people very confused over this. The capstone project is due the night of the last day or the last week of class. I will tell you what the day is. There is no extension on the capstone project. Um, but we'll talk more about that as we get closer. So the 15-week tentative course outline. This week we're just going to touch on uh, the, you know, we're doing the introduction to the course right now, and then we'll also do an introduction to C++ and computers, so chapter 1 and 2. Also, for a quote-unquote assignment, you're not getting graded for it, but you will need this software in order to, to work at home. You need to go to dreamspark.com, and you need to download Microsoft Visual Studio Professional 2012. Do not download 2010. Do not download 2013. Don't download 2012 Professional, okay? Um, you could you could do the Ultimate, and there's a couple other Enterprise or what have you, but 2012 Professional is what I'm using here. This is the exact same thing I'm using here. So if you want things to match what I'm doing, this would be the best way to do it. Um, next week we'll get into classes, objects, and strings. Then we'll start on control statements for the weeks after that. We'll do functions, file processing, for, uh, and then review for midterm, as well as I will assign a project that week. There will be a midterm the week of the 10th. Um, there, will no, there will not be an official lecture that week. We will come back and you'll have your uh, second programming assignment uh, uh, assigned and your first programming assignment due. And we'll cover arrays and vectors, then pointers, work a little bit more on classes than even for two weeks we'll work on classes. Uh, project 2 will be due, then project 3 will be assigned. Operator overloading, inheritance, then that week of the 22nd the capstone is assigned. So you have a f you know three weeks to work on the capstone essentially. Um, policy on computing resources, basically if you're on campus please don't abuse the uh, computing resources. My policy on plagiarism is if I catch you cheating or I, uh, you know, I don't mind people assisting each other to an extent, but I don't want it to become something where, you know, I, I catch you red-handed um, cheating during a test, during the test, or um, I found out that you did someone else's homework for them completely or almost completely. Um, if you're feeling uncomfortable about it, then it's probably cheating. Um, if you if you have no conscience, then it may still be cheating. ADA notification: any students requiring special assistance, including those affected by the Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA, should contact the Access Office and inform the instructor of any special con condition pertaining to their learning. This is an online course, so there are there's a lot more uh, available here as far as being able to pause the uh, video, go back, review. And the only thing we do really in person is the uh, midterm. But if you need special accommodations of some sort because of a, uh, a physical, emotional, mental handicap of some sort, please contact Access on the Orchard Ridge campus. That's this campus that I'm uh, recording from. So you can contact them and explain to them your problems, and they'll uh, try to work out something for you. FERPA is the Federal Education Pri uh, Rights and Privacy Act. It means basically that I cannot share your personal information to anyone, including students, uh, other students, your parents, relatives, without written consent. So if mommy or daddy wants to know what you're getting on a particular course, they cannot contact me without your consent. Okay, anyone who takes these courses, even if um, they're dual enrolled with a high school and they're only 14 or 15, I treat them like adults. You do not, uh, I don't just divulge information about you unless you give me written consent saying, hey, you know, this is this is the name of the person that could contact you and ask me how I've been doing. But really, you can tell how you've been doing by the grades that will be posted on Desire to Learn. So if you want to show someone your grades, you are welcome to do that through Desire to Learn. Uh, there are uh, tutors 
available in F building. I am not sure if there are any C++ tutors this summer, uh, but people can help with general computing and general programming. Some of them are very, very skilled with Java, so, and some of them are uh, moderately skilled with C++. I think one or two might be really skilled with C++, but I'm not sure of the schedule right now. You'd have to call the CIS department and ask them, um, or shoot me an email if you're interested in a particular day, and I'll try to find out what uh, the tutor schedule is like. The disclaimer basically says that I can modify the syllabus, syllabus so that the um, your education uh, gleaned from the syllabus is, or gleaned from this course is um, more effective. I, I'm not going to make anything more complicated. I'm going. I would, if anything, maybe extend a deadline a, a day or two or something like that. Um, that's what the disclaimer is for, so people don't complain about. Um, oh, you made it due on Friday, but then you extended it to Saturday. You know, I don't know. I don't know that I've ever had anyone complain about extending a deadline, but uh, this is just to give basically an out to say, hey, um, you know, don't don't think that everything on the syllabus will be exact, but most of it's pretty solid, and we try to follow it uh, pretty exactly. So again, this week um, we're doing the introduction to the course and the introduction to C++. Um, I did upload some slides, uh, Chapter 1 and Chapter 2, directly from the publisher. They are very large sets of slides, uh, but don't be concerned. I do a lot of skipping around, and I don't just read the slides to you. These are basically just a uh, placeholder, really. They're not uh, intended for me to go through every possible detail. Uh, but we will start on the slides. So uh, the chapter um, one slides are available through here. Um, the could I guess add a property add a description. So this would be a chapter one slides, right? And then these are oh I guess I can change that too. We'll do this. We'll say chapter one slides, and then. Uh, Chapter 2 slides. Usually I do that when I first upload them, but I forgot to change the name here. So we'll, um, that's fine. All right, so you've got the Chapter 1 slides and the Chapter 2 slides available, and also the, uh, this is a supplemental document I have created. This is basically kind of a, a few page summary of the two chapters. Uh, so it might help you with some of the major points. Okay, so Introduction to Computers and C++ starts with Chapter 1 from the Diddle and Deedle book, Diddle and Deedle book, uh, in uh, the ninth edition. Um, the objectives, uh, for some of this we'll see exciting recent developments in the computer field, computer hardware, software, and networking basics, data hierarchy, uh, different set, uh, types of programming languages, basic object technology concepts, basic overview of the Internet and the World Wide Web, uh, typical C++ program development environment, test driving a C++ app, and some key recent software technologies and how computers can help you make a difference. So this is the first set of slides that we'll go through. Do not be intimidated by the 140 down here. We will go through them fairly quickly, um, but uh, well, hopefully. So a couple things. C++ is a powerful computer programming language that's appropriate for technically oriented people with little or no programming experience and for experienced programmers to use in building substantial information systems. Um, you'll write instructions commanding the computer to perform uh, those kinds of tasks. There are things we need to be concerned with such as the software. Uh, these are basic these are fundamental concepts, so if you think, oh, well, I know all this stuff, I still highly recommend that you pay attention uh, because things get fast really quick. And the number one cause of people dropping this course or doing poorly is arrogance. Uh, you'll get to the point where you might think, well, I already have programming experience in such and such language, and, you know, I did C, I did Java, I did, so this is going to be a breeze. Uh, some of it might be easy for you, but take every opportunity to learn um, and this is definitely an opportunity to learn. So, uh, Software are the instructions that you write. Hardware are the physical components. So if you, if you can't touch it, uh, props to MC Hammer. If you can't touch it, it's software. If you can touch it, um, even if you'd had to go digging around in some sort of box of some sort, um, like open up the case of the computer or something and touch the components, if they are physically uh, touchable, they're tangible, then they're hardware.
So if they're not, you can't touch them, they're software. If you can't touch them, they're hardware. Usually that's the case, almost 99.9% .9 of the time. You'll learn object-oriented programming or object-aware programming, which is today's key programming methodology. Now this is a brand new book, essentially, and object-oriented programming is still um, the uh, king of the hill as far as programming paradigms are concerned. You'll create many software objects in the real world. Now we'll, we'll learn what those are uh, more later on. So C++ is one of today's most popular programming development, uh, software development languages. The uh, text provides an introduction in programming in the C++11. This is one advantage you'll have, oops, this is one advantage you'll have if you have the ninth edition of the textbook is that you'll see some of the developments, new developments in the C++11 uh, standard. So the ISO and the IEC have standardized this C++11. It was for a long time known as C++0X and the reason for that is because they figured it would be uh, released, the new standard would be released sometime in 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. They didn't know when, but it ended up taking longer, so the 0X <laughs> very quickly became a uh, a 1X. Um, and so C++11, 2011 is when the new standard was ultimately released. In use today are more than a billion general purpose computers and a billion more cell phones, smartphones, handheld devices such as tablet computers. The uh, number of mobile internet users will reach approximately 134 million by 2013, that's already passed. Um, smart so smartphone sales surpassed personal computer sales in 2011, so that's pretty interesting uh, what's going on in the industry right now. Tablet sales are expected to account for over 20% of all computer sales by 2015. And by 2014, the smartphone app market is expected to exceed $40 billion. Okay, The explosive gross growth is creating significant opportunities for programming mobile apps. So uh, computers and the internet in industry and research. Many of the most influential and successful businesses in the last two decades are technology companies such as Apple, IBM, Hewlett-Packard, etc. Uh, some of the newer ones, Facebook and Twitter. Um, Google's relatively new, Amazon relatively new. Uh, but really, Facebook and Twitter are some of the youngest ones up here. Groupon, still Foursquare. Um, these companies are major employers of people who study computer science, computer engineering, information systems, or related disciplines. Okay. Um, I won't go through all of this stuff, but it gives you um, an overview of the uses of computers. Amber Alert System, Human Genome, Cloud Computing, etc. Uh, a little more, so I'm not going to go over all those. Uh, game programming, one of my personal favorites. I do teach a game design course here, but you'll notice that the most sophisticated games can cost as much as $100 million to develop, such as Activision's Call of Duty Black Ops was one of the best selling games of all times. It earned $360 million in one day. Okay, so we're talking about massive amounts of money available in the computer industry. Uh, the game industry alone, game programming industry, makes more money every year than the automobile and movie industry combined, if you want to let that sink in for a minute. So game programming, just game programming, makes more money than the automobile or the automotive and the um, movie industry combined every year. That doesn't include other software, it's just games. So hardware and software. Computers can perform calculations and make logical decisions phenomenally faster than human beings can. Today's personal computers can perform billions of calculations in one second, more than a human can perform in a lifetime. So in one second, the computer can perform more calculations than you can in your entire life. Supercomputers are already performing thousands of trillions, so that's in the quadrillions of instructions per second. So if you look at that, that's um, each supercomputer can perform in a second uh, a million times, a million times more, and even more than that, than a human can perform in a lifetime. The supercomputer can do that in one second. Computers process data under the control of sequences of instructions called computer programs. Okay, this is where you're going to come in. These programs guide the computer through ordered actions specified by people called uh, computer programmers. 
the programs, the intangible part of the uh, that run on the computer, are called software. Um, you'll learn a key programming methodology that's enhancing programmer uh, productivity, thereby reducing software development costs, which is called object-oriented programming. Uh, many modern languages, most modern languages that are in the um, systems area and even a lot of other areas, use object-oriented uh, programming. Java, C Sharp, Visual Basic, C++, they all use um, object-oriented programming. A computer consists of various devices referred to as hardware. So these are the things that are physical. For example, the keyboard, screen, mouse, hard disks, memory, even though it's inside the computer, it's still you can still touch it, so it is hardware. DVD drives and processing units. Computing costs are dropping dramatically owing to a rapid development in hardware and software technologies. Computers that might have filled large rooms and cost millions of dollars decades ago are now inscribed on silicon chips smaller than a fingernail, costing perhaps a few dollars each. Um, some of you maybe on Facebook or Twitter or Tumblr have seen a picture of a guy wearing a hazmat suit, essentially, um, with a gigantic uh, several hundred or several thousand pound uh, disc sitting in front of him. It's a gigantic... It's, about half as big as he is, but it's definitely heavier. <clears throat> if you've seen this picture, it's um, basically a 250 megabyte disk, and it costs um, well into the hundreds of thousands of dollars back in the, I believe, the 80s or 70s. And nowadays, you can go out and pay a few bucks and get a flash drive the size of your um, fingernail, a small flash drive, which is 16 gigabytes that has 64 times as much memory as what cost hundreds of thousands of dollars just a couple decades ago. Uh, so things do, things are getting, uh, uh, the hardware is getting very cheap and the technology is rising exponentially. Moore's Law, um, for, for many decades hardware costs have fallen rapidly. Every year or two the capacities of computers have uh, approximately doubled inexpensively. This trend is often called Moore's Law, named for the person who identified it in the 1960s, Gordon Moore, who's one of the, co who's one of the founders of Intel. Um, he uh, technically said that the processing power uh, would double, approximately double every 18 months. That was Moore's Law. But it has been kind of manipulated and changed, and it is relatively accurately. It is approximately doubling uh, in capacity, and by capacity we mean storage space in some cases and uh, computing power every 18 months. The capacities double uh, without much of a an increase in cost, if any. Um, so costs have plummeted as enormous demand for communications bandwidth, information carrying capacity, has attracted intense competition. Such phenomenal improvement is fostering what we call the information revolution. All right, still going on. Mobile revolution, information evolution, uh, revolution. These are all very, very um, important uh, things that are going on right now. So computer organization. We probably want to get an idea of how computers are organized. I won't go over all of the stuff that's going on in here, but you should refer to figure 1.2 in the book or these slides. And... Uh, Regardless of the differences in physical appearance, computers can be envisioned as divided into various logical units or sections. So you've got the input unit, um, which is the receiving section. It obtains data from input devices such as the keyboard. You start typing, the input unit takes the uh, information in. DVD, Blu-ray uh, Blu disc, uh, USB flash, thumb drives, etc. Um, output unit is the shipping section, takes the information from the computer that has been processed, places it onto various output devices. The fact that you're able to watch a monitor right now is partly the result of an output unit. The memory unit, this is rapid access, relatively low capacity warehouse. Um, the memory unit is often called memory, plain old memory, or primary memory. This should not be uh, confused with uh, long-term storage. For example, a hard disk is not considered memory, quote-unquote, in the terms if someone just says, I have so much memory on my computer. Uh, main memory or primary memory on uh, the desktops and notebooks is called RAM often. 
Uh, sometimes they contain around or as much as 16 gigabytes, uh, and a gigabyte stands for a, uh, for approximately one billion bytes. In the processor itself, the what we call the CPU, you actually have two parts: the what they're calling further the CPU, and the ALU, which is, which is the arithmetic logic unit. This is the manufacturing sector a section that performs calculations such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and also makes decisions. So if there's if it has to decide to go one way or the other based on a certain condition being the case, the arithmetic logic unit is the one that performs this. The central processing unit is the administrative section that coordinates and supervises the operation of the other sections. CPU tells the input unit when information should be read, tells the ALU when the information from the memory unit should be used in calculation, etc., etc. A multi-core processor implements multiple processors on a single integrated circuit chip. A dual-core processor, for example, has two CPUs, quad-core has four. Today's desktop have uh, processors that can execute billions of instructions per second. And secondary storage unit, this is what we're talking about when we say uh, hard drive or flash drive, etc. These are secondary storage. They're not uh, in memory and they're not generally affected by the power going out. Main memory is what we call volatile memory. That means it will actually go out. Uh, whatever's in memory will be lost if the power goes out in most circumstances. So uh, data hierarchy. Data items processed by computers form a data hierarchy that becomes larger and more complex in structure as we progress from bits to characters to fields and so on. So at the very, very smallest level, the, the smallest addressable unit of memory is a byte. That's eight uh, bits. A single bit is either a one or a zero. It represents off and on uh, uh, power. So you've got zero or one at each uh, individual location. These are bits. When you have eight of them combined, they represent a byte. A character, for example, may be represented by a single byte. And then that these characters, which are each represented by bytes, uh, one, two, three, four bytes, however many, um, can be combined to make a field. And then the field is combined with other fields in records, and those make a file. So at the lowest level, though, you have to be concerned with bits and bytes. Bits are the smallest data item in computer and can be assigned only the value 0 or 1. Such a data item is called a bit. This is short for binary digit. That's why we call them bits, binary digit. Um, characters, it's tedious for people to work with data in low-level terms of bits. So instead, they prefer working with decimal digits, letters, and special symbols. These digits, letters, special symbols are known as characters. The computer's character set is the set of all the characters that are available. Unicode, for example, um, contains the characters for most of the world's languages. C++ supports several character sets, including 16-bit Unicode. Machine languages, assembly languages, and high-level languages. So programmers write instructions in various programming languages, some directly understandable by computers, and other require immediately or immediate translation steps. Uh, these are generally divided into three general categories or types. We have machine languages, assembly languages, and high-level languages. Firstly, machine language is what the computer can directly understand. This is called generally called the machine code, object code. Machine language usually consists of numbers, ultimate, which are ultimately reduced to zeros and ones. Such languages are cumbersome for humans. That means it's very difficult for humans to read machine language. But the computer, that's exactly what it wants, is machine language. Assembly language came along as a result of machine languages being so hard. Um, the assembly languages are English-like abbreviations to represent elementary operations. These abbreviations form the basis of assembly uh, languages. Now, <clears throat> a computer cannot understand assembly language directly. So what do we do about that? Well, the, trans, uh, the program that takes the assembly language, the code in the assembly language, or assembly code, and it runs it through a program called an assembler, okay? 
And when it converts this, it converts these assembly language uh, programs to machine language. Assembly languages, although they were way better than machine language for humans to write, are still uh, pretty cumbersome and a little bit daunting. So in some cases, it's you know okay to do assembler, but in a lot of cases, you want to use a high-level language because high-level languages speed up the programming process even further. They're even closer to a natural language like English. The translator programs that convert high-level languages are called typically called compilers. They convert the high-level language into the machine language. They allow you to write instructions that look more like everyday uh, English and contain commonly ma used mathematical expressions. So compiling a high-level language program into machine language can take a considerable amount of computer time. So there are other languages that are in a different category. Um, that use interpreters. So interpreter programs were developed to execute high-level language programs directly without the need for compilation. Although they are more slowly, they run more slowly than compiled programs. So languages like a JavaScript and PHP, ASP, these are ultimately uh, processed by interpreters. And now we come to the language that all of you have been waiting for. Um, we've got C++. It evolved from C, which was developed by Dennis Ritchie at Bell Laboratories. Um, Dennis Ritchie and um, one of his associates were working on a uh, program on a, I believe it was, I believe it was uh, Space Invaders. They were working on a game that they wanted to play. And uh, they started, try, it was running on a Multix system, which is a predecessor to Unix. And Bell Laboratories scrapped the Multics project because the operating system became very cumbersome and very uh, uh, large. So they thought, well, what can we do? So they took a kind of a uh, lab computer and they <clears throat> said, you know, we need to write a we need to write something for this. So um, they started writing. They actually ended up inventing Unix in order just to play this game, mostly, uh, because there were a lot of researchers that really had nothing to do anymore because they weren't working on Multics anymore, so they were sitting around trying to write video games. Uh, so video games ultimately led to the development of Unix. One of the guys on that team that developed Unix also invented C. Uh, C is available for most computers and is hardware independent. Uh, it's possible to write programs that are portable for most computers. So basically you take the code from one system to another and all, as long as you have a compiler on that system, uh, whether it has a RISC processor on it, it's running a Sun OS or something, or if you have Linux running on one, Unix running on another, Windows on one, Mac on another, C programs are relatively portable in most uh, scenarios. C++, uh, so this should be C++11, I should say C++11. The C++11 standard is the latest ANSI um, standard for the language uh, developed to evolve the C language to keep pace with the increasingly uh, powerful... Oh, you know what? This is actually C11. I forgot. Okay. Yeah, because C actually was updated as well as C++. So it makes C more consistent with C++. C++ is an extension of C. It was develop, developed by Bjarne Straustrup at Bell Laboratories. C++ provides a number of features that would uh, spruce up the C language. But uh, more importantly, it provides capabilities for object-oriented programming. C++ contains something called the standard library. You will become very familiar with this. C++ programs consist of pieces called classes and functions. We'll learn more about what those are later on. Uh, most uh, C++ programmers take advantage of the rich collections of classes and functions available in the C++ standard library. Two parts to the learning the C++ world, the C++ language itself and how to use the classes and functions in the C++ standard library. Also, many um, special purpose class libraries are supplied by independent software vendors. Uh, so, 
Programming languages in general. In this section um, 1.7, it has provided uh, some brief comments on several pro uh, popular programming languages. You've got Fortran and COBOL, uh, Pascal and Ada, Basic C, Objective C. Objective C is used extensively by Apple. Um, if you're programming natively for iOS, for example, or Mac OS, so if you want to do iPhone programming or programming for Mac, you're going to be using a lot of Objective C, most likely. Java is used extensively in a lot of different uh, scenarios. BlackBerry and Android both use Java natively um, as their primary mobile development. Java is used in a lot of uh, uh, web services and other paradigms. Visual Basic <clears throat> is uh, the latest versions do support object-oriented programming. They're used extensively. C Sharp is kind of Microsoft's um, answer to the languages that it already has, and it has some of the best of all the different worlds. C Sharp is usually the preferred language in a lot of scenarios for developing on um, Windows in certain, certain cases. PHP is an object-oriented open source scripting language. Perl um, is one of the most widely used object-oriented scripting languages for web programming. It was developed in the 80s by Larry Wall. So it does a lot of text processing and things like that. Uh, Python is another object-oriented uh, scripting language. It was released first in 1991. And JavaScript is the most wisely, widely used scripting language. It's primarily used to add programmability to web pages, for example, animations and interactions. It's typically used uh, client side. Ruby on Rails was developed in the mid 90s. Um, it's open source object oriented programming language with simple syntax that's similar to Perl and Python. Um, Scala, short for scalable language, was developed um, in Switzerland. It was released in 2003. It uses both object oriented programming and functional programming paradigms and is designed to integrate with Java. Programming in Scala can reduce the amount of code in your application significantly. Twitter and Foursquare uh, use Scala, so this isn't just some random language that they threw in there for fun. <clears throat> so, introduction to object technology. Objects, or more precisely, as we'll see in Chapter 3, the classes that objects come from are essentially reusable software components. So just think of that right now. Objects are reusable software components. There are date objects, time objects, audio objects, video objects, automobile objects, people objects, etc. Almost any noun can be reasonably represented as a software object in terms of the attributes and behaviors. So attributes are uh, things that describe the object, and behaviors are things that the object does or can be done to the object. So attributes, name, color, size, behaviors, calculating, moving, communicating. So to give a bit of an example, if we consider the automobile as an object, suppose we want to drive a car and make it go faster by pressing its accelerator pedal. Before you drive a car, someone has to design it. Car typically begins as engineering drawings similar to the blueprints that describe the design of a house. Drawings include the design for an accelerator pedal. The pedal hides from the driver the complex mechanisms that actually make the car go faster, just as the brake pedal hides the mechanisms to slow the car, and the steering wheel hides the mechanisms to turn the car. So there's a whole lot of uh, hiding going on here, and thank goodness you don't have to be a mechanic, or a very skilled mechanic um, or engineer in automotives in order just to drive a car. You don't have to know everything about what everything's doing. You can just basically... Um, use the interface uh, that is provided for you. In other, way, in other words, the uh, gas pedal and um, the brakes and such. You can use those and um, you can uh, you can use those to work with um, the uh, abstractions that are available to you. So, if you have a um, if you have a complex mechanism such as a microwave, I don't have to be a physics 
uh, a physicist in order to know how the radi radiation works and everything. I just basically put in numbers and it makes the popcorn, right? So this abstraction, this object technology enables people with little or no knowledge of how engines, uh, well, I'm sorry, the uh, development of a car and the way a car works enables people with little or no knowledge of how engines, braking, and steering mechanisms work uh, to drive a car easily. But before you can drive the car, it has to be built from the engineering drawings. So the completed car has an actual accelerator pedal to make the car go faster, but even that's not enough. The car won't accelerate on its own, so the driver must press the pedal to accelerate the car. Um, this is an analogy with the object technology that we've uh, been introduced to thus far, or that we will be introduced to in more detail in a minute. Member functions and classes. So, the class is the blueprint. The objects are the actual car built from the blueprint. I'll give you that heads up. So, member functions are the behaviors that belong to the class. Performing a task in a program requires a member function. Houses, it houses the pro, uh, program statements that actually perform its task. It hides these statements from the user just as the accelerator pedal of a car hides the driver, uh, hides from the driver the mechanisms of making the car go fast. C++, we create a program unit called a class to house the set of member functions that perform the class's task. A class is similar in concept to a car's engineering drawings, which house the design of an accelerator pedal, steering wheel, and so on. Just as someone has to build the car from its engineering drawings, you have to build an object before you can use it. An object is therefore referred to as an instance of a class. So an object would be like the car, the class is the blueprint. It promotes reuse, just as a car's engineering drawings can be reused many times to build many cars, you can reuse a class many times to build many objects. Reuse of existing classes when building new classes and programs saves time and effort. Reuse also helps you build more reliable and effective systems because existing classes and components often have gone through extensive testing, debugging, and performance tuning. And just as the notion of interchangeable parts was crucial to the Industrial Revolution, reusable classes are crucial to software revolution that has been spurred by object technology. So, um, when you drive a car, pressing its gas pedal basically sends a message, we can think of it as, to the car to perform a task, that is to go faster. Similarly, you can send messages to objects. Each message is implemented as a member function call that tells the member function the object to perform its task. So you could have defined what the gas pedal does or defined what the brake does, but unless you actually interact with it, unless you actually press them, they're not going to do anything. <clears throat> so, now, we said that the an object is basically a collection of attributes and data members. Um, a class has, or a car has attributes, such as the color, its number of doors, amount of gas, etc. And the car's attributes are represented as part of its design in the engineering diagrams. Each car, every car, maintains its own attributes. Each car knows how much gas is in its own tank, but not how much of it, how much is in the tank of other cars. An object has attributes that it carries along as it's used in a program. We call these attributes the class's data members. Classes encapsulate, um, this is one of the uh, primary or uh, fundamental topics within object-oriented programming. We'll take a deeper look in later chapters, but for right now, basically the three pillars, the three primary characteristics of object-oriented programming are encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. So encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. We'll start with encapsulation. Once we're f comfortable with classes, we'll move to things like inheritance and maybe a little bit on polymorphism at some point. So classes encapsulate, or wrap, the attributes and member functions into objects. An object's attributes and member functions are uh, intimately related. Objects may communicate with one another, but they're normally not allowed to know how other objects are implemented. Implementation details are hidden from the, uh, within the object's 
uh, themselves. Information hiding is crucial to good software engineering. So you're hiding uh, how the different actions are performed and what you're, uh, what you're doing on the inside. Um, but you're not letting the outside world see all the information and all the nitty gritty, but you are allowing them to maybe uh, request something of you or to produce a particular command of some sort. But you're not going to let them know how you're doing it. Inheritance. Um, it's a new... Uh, a new class of objects can be created quickly and conveniently by inheritance. A new class absorbs the characteristics of an existing class, possibly customizing them, and adding unique characteristics of its own. If we go back to our car, anal car analogy, an object of the class convertible, which is a type of car, is an object of the more general class automobile. But more specifically, the roof can be raised or lowered. So we would say that the um, convertible inherits from uh, automobile. So we have object-oriented analysis and design. It's related to object-oriented programming. How will you create the code for your programs? Followed a, uh, you follow a detailed analysis process for determining your project's requirements. So for example, you define what the system is supposed to do. And it has to be specific. Then, after you're done with that analysis, you make a design that satisfies um, the requirements of the projects. So for example, how does the system accomplish that? So the what of the system is related to the requirements, the how is related to the design. Determine the requirements before you do the design. Uh, careful, uh, carefully review the design before writing any code. This is the case in most, uh, all but the most simple um, examples. If the process involves analyzing the design or, and designing your system from an object-oriented point of view, it's called an OOAD, or Object-Oriented Analysis and Design Process. Languages like C++ are object-oriented. Object-oriented programming allows you to implement an object-oriented design as a working system. Uh, UML is the Unified Modeling Language. It's now the most widely used graphical uh, scheme for modeling um, object-oriented systems. Um, we will look at this in just a moment. I'm going to take a quick break. Um, you could, too, just pause the video. I'm going to pause it, and then we'll come back and start talking again. All right, so um, C++ systems generally consist of three parts. You've got the program development environment, the language, and the C++ standard library. C++ programs typically go through six phases. You have edit, preprocess, compile, link, load, and execute. So phase one consists of editing a file with an editor program, normally known simply as an editor. So this is where you type a C++ source code, the C++ source code, um, is in the editor. You make any necessary corrections, save the program. C++ source code um, file names often end with .cpp. That's the most common. You will see .cxx occasionally. The reason it's cxx is because the pluses are not allowed. They have other meanings in systems. So they, the xx looks like two pluses on their sides. Um, that is pretty rare nowadays. Uh, .cc and then .capital C. Those are um, this is uppercase, by the way. Um, those are often used, or they're used more often on um, Unix, Linux platforms. .cpp is the most common on across platforms. Um, so here is the typical C++ development environment editing phase. You have the programmer creating the program in the editor and then store it on disk, just like any other file. Um, so what are the editors that we use? Well, on Linux or Unix, we have VI and Emacs. Um, C++ software packages for Microsoft Windows, such as Microsoft Visual C++, okay, the Express version or the professional version, which you can download uh, at the uh, link and instructions I provided. Uh, you can also use a simple text editor, such as Notepad, Notepad++, um, WordPad, things like that, to write the C++ code if you wanted to. Integrated development environments, or IDEs, what Visual Studio is one of, 
Uh, they provide tools that support the software development process, including the editors for writing and editing programs, and debuggers for locating logic errors, which are errors that cause programs to execute incorrectly. So um, popular IDEs are Microsoft Visual uh, Studio 2012. The version that they're, they discuss a lot in the book is the Express Edition. Uh, you don't really don't download that version. Um, get it off your system, get the professional version because it's freely available to you now because you're students. Um, C++, Dev C++ by Bloodshed. Uh, NetBeans and Eclipse also have uh, C++ capabilities. Xcode through Apple. If you have a Mac, um, you absolutely don't have access to, we'll say you don't have access to a Windows machine, um, then I will accept the source files directly from Xcode. You don't send me the whole projects. There's also a program called CodeLite. Phase two, so phase one is the editing. Phase two is the uh, you give the command to compile the program. First thing that happens is a preprocessor program executes automatically before the compiler's translation phase begins. So we call that preprocessing phase two, and then compiling is phase three. The preprocessor goes through the program. It obeys commands called preprocessing directives, which indicate that certain manipulations are to be performed on the programs before uh, compilation. These manipulations usually include other text files to be performed and perform various text replacements. So you have the preprocessor. Um, it uh, takes the program, processes the code. Phase three is where the compiler translates the C++ program into machine language code. This is also referred to as object code. So machine code ob or machi machine language code or machine code and object code all mean the same thing. So compiler again interacts with the object code uh, or creates the object code from the source code and stores it on disk. Um, the next thing is phase four. This is called linking. Okay, so we just got done with the uh, the editing, the preprocessing, the compiling. Um, now we're at linking. The object code produced by a C++ compiler typically contains quote unquote holes due to these missing parts. Okay, due to missing parts. A linker links the object code with the code for the missing functions to produce an executable program. So if the program compiles and links correctly, an executable image is produced. So that's the program you can actually use, the program you can execute. So often you might be calling, for example, a function that's available in an, a library that's outside of your program. So the linking phase will link in that uh, the calls from the library. Phase five is called loading. Before memory, uh, before program can be executed, it has to be first placed in memory. Um, don't know why the T is there. Um, this is done by the loader, which takes the executable image from disk and transfers it to memory. So any program you run, whether it's PowerPoint, Word, uh, Visual Studio itself, any of your video games, these programs, uh, much of the a program itself actually exists on disk, whether it's your disk or a disk on a server somewhere. They exist on disk, so they're in long-term storage or secondary storage. In order to use them, they have to be loaded into memory. Okay, Have to be loaded into memory. Main memory. So you have main memory, primary memory here. The loader takes the image from disk and puts it in main memory. So what about phase six? Phase six is the actual execution of the program. Finally, the computer under the control of its central processing unit executes the program one instruction at a time. That means the program starts running. Some modern computer architectures can execute several instructions in parallel. It's called parallel processing. So the CPU reads the memory and actually executes what's in memory. A memory, again, is kind of like a temporary, live, fast um, work area. The CPU actually takes these instructions and executes them, and it possibly stores new data and values in, as the program executes. So what problems might occur at execution time? Uh, programs might not work on the first try. Each of the preceding phases can fail because of various errors. So for example, you might have a compiler error, which means you might uh, uh, write the wrong C++ syntax, in which case the compiler will yell at you before and it won't even bother trying to link or doing anything because you have to fix what's in the compiler first or what goes to the compiler first. Okay. Uh, certain C++ functions take their input from CN, Stanford, uh, in standard input stream, 
uh, which is normally the keyboard, but CN can be redirected to another device. Data is often output to C out, which is the standard output stream. Normally the computer screen, but C out, again, like CN, can be redirected to another re uh, device. When we say that the program prints a result, we normally mean that the result is displayed on a screen. We're not talking about it printing to paper necessarily. Usually not. Um, there are also standard error streams, which are uh, referred to as C error. Um, it's used for displaying error messages. Okay, so uh, they're having you run and interact with an application that's already prepared. We're not going to uh, go through that. That's We'll start on our own code in just a minute. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Uh, operating systems, we probably should look at operating systems real quick. Um, Uh, software systems that make uh, using computers more convenient for users, application developers, and system administrators. So they provide services that allow each application to ex execute safely, efficiently, and concurrently in parallel with other applications. So the software that contains the core components of the operating system is called the kernel. Okay, K-E-R-N-E-L, not like Colonel Sanders, but the kernel of a, a piece of corn. Uh, the popular desktop operating systems include Linux, Windows, and OS X, formerly called Mac OS X, or OS X. Popular mobile operating systems include things like Google's Android, Apple's iOS, uh, BlackBerry OS, and Windows Phone. So um, Windows is proprietary. It's made by a commercial company. It was uh, in, developed in the mid-80s. It consisted of a graphical user interface built on top of DOS. Uh, Windows borrowed many other concepts developed, uh, such as icons, menus, and windows, developed by Xerox PARC and popularized by early Ma Apple. So basically, Apple stole the idea for a mouse and the icons and GUI uh, in the form that we use it um, from Xerox. Apple stole it from Xerox, and Microsoft basically stole it from Apple. Uh, so, <laughs> they're both thieves. Um, Windows 8 is Microsoft's latest operating system. Its features include enhancements to user interface, faster startup times, further refinement of security, etc., etc. Windows is proprietary, meaning it's controlled by Microsoft exclusively. It's not open source. And Windows is by far, even though Linux and Mac users would like you to think that Windows is dying, it is not. Windows is by far the world's most widely used operating system. And it is, in many ways, some of their incarnations are getting more and more stable. Although Windows 8 is very different from previous versions, um, the machine I'm currently on right now is Windows 7. Uh, Windows 7 is actually extremely stable, and I think Windows 8 is going to offer quite a bit of stability. 8.1 is the uh, release right now. Um, Linux is an open source operating system. Um, it is a development style that departs from proprietary development that dominated the software's early years. Individuals and companies contribute their efforts in developing, and they typically do this at no charge. So this is what we call the open uh, source software movement. There are some key organizations in the open source community, Eclipse, Mozilla, Apache, and SourceForge. Facebook, which was launched from a college dorm room, uh, was built with open source software. So that's something to keep in mind. So Linux is the most popular open source operating system. It's developed by volunteers. <clears throat> These There are actually flavors of Linux as well, by the way. Uh, popular in servers, personal computers, and embedded systems. Um, the, kernel that, um, the kernel that sits in Android, uh, the virtual machine, um, is based on Linux, Dalvik. Uh, there are other flavors of Linux that are run on um, desktops and personal computers, uh, desktops and laptop personal computers and tablets. Um, Red Hat, SUSE, um, uh, Nopix, Ubuntu, things like that. Apple OS X, Apple iOS, um, 79, Steve Jobs and several Apple employees visited Xerox Park to learn about Xerox's desktop computer that featured a graphical user interface. That GUI served as the inspiration for Apple's Macintosh, which launched with much fanfare at the memorable Super Bowl ad in 1984.
You can probably look it up very easily on YouTube. So just look up uh, Macintosh or Apple Super Bowl ad 1984. <clears throat> Object or Objective C was created by Brad Cox and T uh, Tom Lovett's Stepstone, and it was basically for adding object-oriented programming to the C programming language, just like C++ did. Objective, Objective C by far, uh, quote-unquote, lost the battle um, as far as being the king of the hill in object-oriented C languages. C++ definitely uh, trumped it, but Objective-C is used, uh, especially with iOS, it's used significantly. Android is based on Java. Um, as of uh, June 2012, more than 900,000 Android dev uh, devices were being activated each day. Okay, it's quite a bit. Android smartphones are definitely outselling iPhones now. So, uh, so what's the Internet and the World Wide Web? You probably know uh, something about the Internet and the World Wide Web, but they are different, and it's a good idea to solidify what you understand so you have a general understanding of computers and how they interact in the context of the Internet. So the Internet is a global network of computers. It's made possible by convergence of computing and communications technology. Uh, contrary to popular belief, Al Gore did not invent the Internet. In the late 1960s, ARPA, which is the Advanced Research Project Agency, it's part of the Department of Defense in the United States, rolled out blueprints for networking the main computer systems of about a dozen ARPA-funded universities and research institutions. So they wanted to somehow connect all these universities so they could share information more effectively. ARPA proceeded to implement ARPANET, which eventually evolved in today's Internet. It rapidly became clear that communicating quickly and easily via email was the key early benefit of the ARPANET. So email was a huge, huge, huge uh, development. It's an application that runs on the Internet, uh, just like the web. So the Internet and the web are not the same thing. The Internet is basically the underlying infrastructure and the computers that are actually networked. The web is a series of software, essentially, that allows you to browse through um, documents that are located onto the documents and um, uh, sometimes streaming video and images and things like that that are available on the web. Uh, packet switching. The primary goal of ARPANET was to allow multiple users to send and receive information simultaneously over the same communication paths, such as phone lines or cable. Packet switching is a technique in which digital data uh, is sent in small bundles called packets. Packets contain addresses, error control, and sequencing information, and the addresses inf information or the address information allows packets to be routed to their destinations. Uh, packet switching is how um, modern uh, internet works. It works differently from standard um, uh, standard plain old telephone system which is circuit switched. Um, packet switching at the network level you take, if you have, a, have to send say a really large piece of data um, document, uh, video, image, what have you it will send all the data in form of packets. It will send them in these little tiny bundles uh, to the destination. So that means the, each packet may take end up taking a different route um, to the destination, but ultimately they get reassembled at their destination and then they get put back together to whatever they were originally. Um, sequencing information helps in reassembling the packets because of complex routing mechanisms could arrive out of order. That's very much the possibility. Packets from different senders were intermixed on the same lines to efficiently use the available bandwidth. Packet switching, a technique, greatly reduced transmission costs as compared with the cost of dedicated communication lines. So instead of buying a physical line or a physical connection through a company um, from point A to point B, you can use the Internet, and basically it sends this data. You can have secure versions as well. Uh, sends the data over the network um, without a ded having to have a dedicated circuit from one place to the other. Uh, TCP IP, if you're familiar with any kind of networking, um, the packets, uh, when we talk about packets, we're generally talking about things that occur at the um, uh, network level of what we call the OSI model. On top of the network level is the uh, transmission control protocol that sits on top of the internet protocol. So we have the uh, internet uh, or the network layer and the 
transmission layer on top of that and you have the TCP IP suite of protocols, this uh, protocol for communicating over the ARPANET became known as Transmission Control Protocol. As the internet evolved, organizations worldwide were implementing their own networks. One challenge was to get these different networks to communicate. ARPA accomplished this with the development of IP. That sits, uh, that's called the Internet Protocol, and it sits um, at the network layer. It truly helps us con ca create this network of networks, the current architecture of the Internet. Combined set of protocols is co commonly called TCP IP. Now, we're moving a little higher up into stuff that's closer to human. Uh, we don't generally as users of the web, uh, as we're acting as users of the web, we generally don't interact directly uh, with TCP or IP. Um, that's usually handled by our own computers, routers, network cards, uh, switches, things like that. But as you move up here, you end up getting into application level protocols, uh, such as uh, HTTP, which exist in um, applications such as the World Wide Web. So the World Wide Web allows you to locate and view multimedia based documents on almost any subject over the Internet. In 1989, Tim Berners-Lee of CERN, which is the uh, European Organization for Nuclear Research, uh, began to develop a technology for sharing information via hyperlinked text documents. This is called hypertext markup language. The HTTP is the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. It's a communications protocol used to send information over the web. A URL is the Uniform Resource Locator. That is what you're talking about when you have www.google.com or such and such. Those are all URLs. Okay, so if someone asks you for the URL for a site, that's what they're talking about. Um, <clears throat> each web page on the internet is associated with a unique URL. HTTPS is the secure version, encrypted version, um, of the hypertext transfer protocol. So if you're logging into a bank account or a customer account at Amazon or something like that, and you don't see the S at the end of HTTP in the URL, then there's probably a problem of some sort. Okay, so we won't go through that stuff. You can go over Web 2.0 on your own. Um, key software development terminology. You can look here and see what the uh, different buzzwords are. Ajax, Agile Software, LAMP, <clears throat> Software as a Service, Platform as a Service, etc., etc. Um, okay, C++11 and the open source Boost libraries. C++11 was formally called C++0x. It's the latest uh, programming language standard which was published by ISO IEC. In 2011, the main goals were to make C++ easier to learn, improve library building capabilities, and increase compatibility with the C programming language. The new standard extends the C++ standard library and includes several features and enhancements to improve performance and security. Uh, further, the major C++ compiler vendors have already implemented many of the new C++ features. For more information, you can visit the Standards Committee website at this location. These locations, <clears throat> copies of the language specification itself, can be purchased um, at this location right here. The Boost libraries are free, open source libraries created by members of the C++ community. It has grown to over a hundred libraries, with more being added regularly. So often. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's been created already for you that you can download and um, use as, from the Boost libraries. Regular expressions, you'll hear that term every once in a while. This is used to match uh, character patterns in text. They can be used to validate data to, sh to ensure that it's in a particular format, to re replace parts of one string with another, or to split a string. Many common bugs in C and C++ code are related to pointers, a powerful programming capability that C++ absorbed from C, and in the new version, smart pointers help you avoid errors associated with traditional pointers. All right. So this goes over some of the uh, uh, C++ 11 feature descriptions at different companies, including Microsoft, uh, Visual C++. <clears throat> 
more information. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, jump into the introduction to C++ programming and input operator uh, output operators. Uh, we'll, I'm going to take a quick break and then I'll come back and record more. You can pause too if you need to. And uh, I'm opening up Visual Studio right now. We'll get this ready um, for an example if we do some examples. And I'm going to pause and then come back in just a moment. All right, so introduction to C++ programming, input, output, and uh, operators. So we'll introduce C++ programming. This is probably the part you've mostly been waiting for. Uh, most of the C++ programs you'll study in this book process data and display results. So we'll uh, do a first program here. Um, to show you how to do this in Visual Studio, I actually put instructions um, on the uh, supplemental material that I provided for you. But you can, at the startup screen, you can click New Project or just go to File, New, Project. And you have to be very careful with how you do this. Make sure you're under the right language. This currently says C Sharp, so that's wrong. Um, other languages, if you set C++ as your primary language, it will show up up here instead. Um, I'm going to actually create a directory uh, just for C++, so I would recommend you do the same. You could keep it in the default location. I don't personally recommend that. Um, I recommend the default location would probably be somewhere on your My Documents or what have you, but I recommend putting a folder somewhere in your desktop or somewhere where you will remember it. Um, as long as you know where it is and you're comfortable with where it is, then you should be okay. So I'm putting it in the work dir here. I'm going to call this one. Also, this is another thing too many people do wrong. Um, I want you to name it something useful. It's usually a good idea to do that. So we'll say lecture, let's call this lecture one examples with an underscore. Make sure it says 132 console application. You're going to hit OK. There's an additional step we have here under application settings. Verify that it says console application and check empty project. That's very important. Then hit finish. And it will create an empty project for you. Take a little while. Uh, we have an empty project here. It has a few folders in it. Um, the empty project lives inside of a solution, so in Visual Studio the way things work is you have a solution, and a solution contains one or more projects, and then each project contains the source files and resources. So for now I'm just going to create a single source file by going to uh, Source Files, right click it, go to Add, New Item, and then the options uh, will come up under Add New Item. I'm going to select C++ File, .cpp. I'm going to call this one main.cpp. And this is the editor we were talking about earlier. There's no compilation going on yet. This is just code editing. And your most basic program. The version they show in the slides does not use the using namespace standard directive at the top. If you put this then distinct from their code, you won't have to put std colon colon in front of everything. That means standard for standard namespace. Um, you won't have to do that if you put the using namespace standard. So this is called main. This is an entry point uh, to the program. So when your program executes, main is what will be called. Okay, in other words, main is uh, whatever's in main is what your program is ultimately. So you can call other functions once we learn how to write other functions. But for right now, let's just do this. We'll say hello there. Okay, and I want to go over a couple parts here. Cout and indel both live inside of IOStream. They're variables. Cout will actually send things to the um, console. Then it's followed by these two less than signs right here. What we call these two less than signs are the stream insertion operators, or the stream insertion operator. Each of these is a stream insertion operator. Uh, the reason we don't put std colon colon in front of this and that, like they might in the book, is because we've got the using directive at the top. Um, so I'm going to build this. And you'll notice near the bottom, once it's done, it'll say build succeeded. Then you can go to de debug. After you went to build, build solution, you can go to debug, start without debugging. 
and it will bring up a console right here. It'll say hello there, and then press any key con to continue is actually generated by the Visual Studio environment. It is not generated by your program. It's just a way to pause it. So <clears throat> it says hello there. That's what it outputs uh, to the screen. Um, the example they give you, they put this stuff here with two forward slashes. Those are called comments. Okay. So if you have two forward slashes, that's called a single line uh, comment. And you can do comments basically that do not have to be um, code examples, or don't have to be actual source code in C++. You can put comments um, that will, p that will uh, state uh, certain information about your program. I might, I might put a comment down here and say this prints to the screen. But once you're familiar with what all this does, you probably won't put trivial comments, but you'll put good comments. <clears throat> this is actually pretty common to put the name of the programmer at the top and what the project is, or if you're in a class, what class you're in. Often people put the date, 2014. Um, so you can do that. You can also do multi-line comments. So if I didn't want to put the forward slashes in front of each of these, I could uh, conceivably do this. Um, and see that that gets to go away. The oops, sorry, that actually needs to go inside the comment. There we go. Much better. Notice that I can do multiple line comments if I do a forward slash star, which is an asterisk on the shift eight key, and then you can do a star uh, forward slash that closes the multi line comment. If you don't do that, it considers everything a comment. So you're going to have to make sure that you close it once you open it. So that does multiple lines. <coughs> the, um, sorry, the um, two forward slashes does single line comments. Um, Preprocessing directives are messages to the C++ uh, plus preprocessor. Remember we talked about that when you tell it to compile. Um, it The preprocessor actually looks for uh, statements in your code that has a pound sign in front of them. So hash include is a preprocessor directive and it tells the preprocessor I want you to include the code inside of iostream. I want you to include the iostream library so I can use things like cout, uh, cn, indel, the stream insertion operator, or, uh, yeah, stream insertion operators, stream extraction operators, which we'll get to. Um, iostream notifies the preprocessor to include in the program the contents of the input output stream header file which is iostream so this header is a file containing information used by the compiler when compiling any program that outputs data to the screen or inputs data from the keyboard using c++ style stream input output it will cause a compiler error if you forget to include iostream at the top um, you use blank spaces uh, space characters and tab characters to make programs easier to read. Even though the compiler may not care in a lot of um, instances, like for example, um, the return zero right here. Let's get rid of this uh, comment right here just for a second. I could put all the code on this uh, one line here after main. I can even put it up there. And the compiler will still compile it. And it will still run it but this is really not that easy to read okay um, so usually we um, hit enter and cause there to be the uh, curly braces to line up and cause anything inside of this level for example this function main to be tabbed over once so that's important together tabs and space characters are called white space white space characters are normally ignored by the compiler. In other words, the, the compiler doesn't care how you format it. Main is a part of every C++ program. The parentheses after main indicate that main is a program building block called a function. So we call this the main function. All right, The main function. You have the keyword main, or not keyword main, but the word main followed by open and close parentheses. Before that you have the uh, keyword int, which uh, indicates that there is uh, that main should return an integer value. We'll get more into functions and return values at a later time, but for right now, just know at the end you should put return zero. Kind of do this verbatim. If you really are confused about what each of these parts does, it's okay. It's totally okay. Um, everyone is when they first start learning 
C++ or a programming language in general. So exactly one function in every program must be named main. C++ programs begin executing at the function main even if main is not the first function defined in the program. So if you write another function here, call it uh, horse or cow or do something, and you put it in front of main, main will still be uh, where the code goes first, where the program goes first when it is looking for what to load. So um, C++ programs begin executing at function main. The keyword int to the left of main indicates the main returns, quote unquote, an integer, which is also known as a whole number value. So that means it doesn't have a decimal point. The keyword is a word in code that is reserved by C++ for a specific use. For now, just simply include the keyword uh, int in, to the left of main in each of your programs. We've got left brace and right brace. These enclo enclose the uh, body of your program. So what's ever inside these belong to main, okay, and will subsequently be executed. A statement instructs the computer to perform an action. Together, the quotation marks and the characters uh, between them is called a string, a character, string, or a string literal. We refer to characters between double quotation marks simply as strings. Most C++ statements end with a semicolon, known as the statement terminator. Preprocessor directives, though, like it, the include right here, do not end with a semicolon. Okay. We've got this right here, the cout statement actually has a string literal inside of here. Hello there. It has double quotes surrounding on either end. That is important. If you leave the double quotes out on one side or the other, it won't know um, it won't know where the string begins or ends. Now, string, don't think of a string as a thread or a uh, thing that your cat plays with. A string in the context of programming is usually referring to a string of characters or a text string. Okay, so it's what we would call a word or a sentence or a paragraph or even a single character could be considered a string if it's inside double quotes. So those are string literals. Um, typically output and input in C++ are accomplished with streams of characters. Now this is not string, streams. When a C out statement uh, executes it sends a stream of characters to the standard output stream object, in this case uh, C out, which is normally connected to the screen. Uh, the STD before C out is required when we use names that we brought uh, into the program by the preprocessor directive. You can actually use the using namespace standard, which I showed you a second ago, the using directive, to prevent from having to write that in front of all the different statements. In the context of an output statement, the uh, stream, this is the uh, stream insertion operator. Uh, to determine what that means or to remember what it does, is you can think of yourself as the program or think of it as the program and you're saying, well, what am I doing? I'm sending data from the program out to the monitor. So it comes from the program. The origin is the program. So the program is inserting data into the, to the monitor, it's sending data to the monitor. So that's what's called stream insertion operator. The uh, characters backslash n, you could include the characters backslash n or not, that are not printed on the uh, screen. The backslash, which we'll see many, many times in code, is also called an escape character. It indicates that a special character is to be output. So when a backslash is encountered in a string of characters, the next character is combined with the backslash to for, uh, form what we call an escape sequence. So the escape sequence backslash n means new line. So we're using indel here, but if I get rid of the indel, I want you to see what happens. If I build it now and then run it, you'll notice that it says hello there, but it immediately prints press any key to continue. It doesn't put that on the next line It's because we did not indicate there's a new line here. I could put the indel here separated by another stream insertion operator like we had before, or inside of the quotations, I could put a backslash n. That backslash n indicates um, that it's a new line character. So I'm going to build there, run it, and I get the same output as before. So it causes the cursor 
to move to the next, uh, the beginning of the next line on the screen. And here are some of the escape sequences. Um, backslash T does a horizontal tab. Backslash R does a carriage return. Backslash A sounds the system alarm. Uh, that can be really annoying. Uh, I strongly recommend using it. Uh, backslash, uh, double backslash, basically just prints out a backslash. Now the reason we need a double backslash, if you think about it, is if you put a single backslash, it thinks, oh, that's an escape character. So in order to, in order to get it to print out, for example, in the middle of this string here, um, if I want it to actually print out a, a backslash here, I have to put a double backslash, because it escapes the original backslash. Same thing with double and single quotes, since these are usually used to determine, or to delimit, um, a string, you have to put a backslash in front of double or single quotes in order to print the single quote or double quote character. When the return statement is used at the end of the uh, main, the value 0 indicates the program has terminated successfully. It means without any error. According to the C++ standard, if the program execution reaches the end of main without encountering a return statement, it's assumed uh, that the program uh, terminated successfully. Exactly <clears throat> as when the last statement in main is a return statement with the value 0. So, they give you uh, more code. You can actually do this. If I want to, I could put hello there. Let's uh, do this just to show an example here. Hello there. See out, and I'm going to put a space here. I'm going to put my name is John. Okay, with an indel this time. And notice, even though these statements are on separate lines, let's see how it's printed out. Okay, notice they're both printed on the same line. There's a space between them, but that's because of the space I put here. Right? Since this does not have a new line character and it doesn't have an indel, it does not move the cursor to the next line before it starts actually printing this. So even though in the code they're on separate lines, what they actually produce is not on separate lines. Uh, to get a new line character between two different statements, to get an actual blank line in the output, you have to place two new line characters or two indels back to back. All right, so the next program will obtain data from the user. So this time uh, we're going to obtain data and then give it back and then print it back to the um, uh, to the user. So let's uh, let's do this or we'll take, um, we're actually going to use variables now. Remember we talked um, a little bit about return types. Well, you can also store data in what are called variables, okay? These are actually little storage locations that we can put data in. So I'm going to say int num1 and int num2. So these are two integer variables. That means they can hold whole numbers, um, counting numbers and their opposites, 0, 1, 2, negative 5, negative 7, negative 17, anything like that. I'm going to print out to the user, I'm going to say please enter a number. Um, it's going to be similar to what we have here, or an integer, I should probably say that. Please enter an integer, okay, then do an indel, cn num1, and then I'm going to say please enter another integer, and I'll see on num2. And now let's actually create a third integer called sum at the top. And then sum is going to equal num1 plus num2 that we just got from the user. This is getting information from the user. These two symbols right here are called the stream uh, extraction operator because you can think of the data coming in from the keyboard as flowing around in a stream, like a little uh, river going by and I'm taking stuff, I'm taking the fish with the data in them out of the river, so that's stream extraction, I'm extracting it from the stream. Stream insertion is when I'm putting stuff back in the stream, sending it to the monitor. So that's why these are called stream insertion operator and these are called stream extraction operators. Um, so you've got that to data, and then we're gonna say the sum is, you just gotta print sum and an indel. Okay, I'm going to build this and run it. It's going to say, please enter an integer. I'll put 25, then I'll put 50, and I'll say the sum is 75. That's exactly what we expect. So
So declarations introduce what we call identifiers into the programs. The identifiers that we use, uh, num1 and num2, uh, those are called identifiers. That means that um, they identify a particular variable, which is a named storage location in memory. Remember, we were talking about memory before. We were talking about main memory. Well, in order to get the data into the memory, we have to actually use variables. So I say int num1, int num2, int sum. So that means the compiler goes through, and you know when the program runs, it reserves memory for uh, three integers, num1, num2, and sum. Later on, we, we uh, get data into num1 and num2, and then we take the sum and we add these two, and then store them back in sum. And then we print that sum back out to the user onto the monitor. So the identifiers, uh, num1, num2, and sum, are all identifiers. They're variables, which are named storage locations. <clears throat> so look, variables, look, what they say is a location in computer's memory where a value can be stored for use by a program. All variables must be declared with a name and a data type before they can be used. So these three right here, if I wanted to, I could actually do this. I could say int, I'm just going to do it in a comment here, but it, you, you would obviously do it without one. You could say int num1 comma num2 comma sum, and these would all this would declare three integers. You could do it that way. I personally prefer doing them all on separate lines pretty much exclusively, even if they're all the same data type. It seems to be better to read everything that you're looking at, and you can quickly see where something was declared. <clears throat> Other data types. Data type double is for specifying real numbers, and data type char is for specifying character, uh, character data. Real numbers are numbers with decimal points, for example, such as 3.4, 0.0, .0 and negative 11.19. Uh, 0.19. Uh, a char variable may hold only a single lowercase letter, a single uppercase letter, a single digit, or a single special character. Types such as int, double, and char are called fundamental types. A variable name is any valid identifier that is not a keyword. An identifier is a series of characters consisting of letters, digits, and underscores that does not begin with a digit. You can't make a variable name uh, uh, 12 orange or uh, 172. You can't do that because as soon as um, C++ sees a number at the beginning of something, it assumes it's a number. C++ is case sensitive, so that means that uppercase and lowercase letters are different. So if you had two different variables, one was named A1 with a lowercase, and one was a capital A and a 1. These are different identifiers, okay, because it's case sensitive. Uh, declarations of variables can be placed almost anywhere in the program, but they must appear before their corresponding variables are used uh, in the uh, program. A prompt uh, directs the user to take a specific action. CN statement uses the input stream object CN. So a prompt, for these examples, these would be prompts. This one says, please enter an integer. The other one says, please enter another. Those are prompting the user to do something. So they're called prompts. All right. Um, when you calculate the sum, like we did a second ago, we are using the addition operator, so it's what you would know as the plus symbol. We call it the addition operator. It takes two operands, okay? So operator operators are plus equals, for example, and operands are sum num1 num2, okay? So, operators are the plus symbol. It takes two operands, num1 and num2. Once these two are added, they, they have a result between them that is stored in sum, because sum is assigned to the value 
uh, num1 and num2. We, we don't usually call this right here the equals operator. We usually call it the assignment operator. Um, again, this is the addition operator, the plus symbol, and this is called the assignment operator. All right. Um, they're binary operators because they have uh, two different uh, operands. So this right here is an operator. It has two operands, num1 and num2, right? This, even though we can see a lot of stuff going on here, this is also, this equal sign is also a binary operator because it takes this and it takes whatever is the result on this side. So it treats whatever is on this side as one thing. So this has to be done first before you can store the value in sum. Indel is the so-called stream manipulator. Um, Indel is an abbreviation for end line. It basically does essentially the same thing as um, backslash n. Um, using multiple stream insertion operators is a single statement is referred to as concatenating, chaining, or cascading stream insertion operators. Uh, calculations can be performed in any output statements. Um, we probably want to get an idea of some memory concepts. The variable names, such as number one, number two, and sum, actually correspond to locations in the computer's memory. Okay, so variable names correspond to actual locations in the computer's memory. Every variable has a name, a type, a size, and a value. When a value is placed in memory location, the value overwrites the previous value in that location. Thus, placing a new value in memory is said to be destructive. When a value is read out of memory location, the process is non-destructive. So just reading it, you're not changing it, that's called non-destructive. If you do change it, it's called destructive. So we'll say that this is number one. This is our identifier. It contains uh, its variable uh, contains the value 45. Later on you make number 2, it has 72 in it. Uh, sum would add these two together um, and you it would take these two result of an addition operation, addition operator, and it would return the value between those and then store that in sum based on the code that we saw. So what about arithmetic? Can we do arithmetic with C++? Yes, absolutely. Most programs perform arithmetic calculations. Even if it's not an obvious math program, um, they do um, perform calculations. So we have a table coming up that summarizes the C++ arithmetic operators. The asterisk in, indicates um, multiplication. The percent sign is the modulus operator. We'll discuss that shortly, but uh, basically all it does is it uh, yields the remainder after an integer division. So if I say 3 modulus 2, um, if I'm doing a division and working with remainders, I would say that that equals 1, because 2 fits in 1 once, with a remainder of 1. Because 2 times 1 is 2, but there's still that 1 left to make it 3. So the remainder is what modulus is in, uh, interested in. So integer division uh, where both the uh, numerator and the denominator are integers yields an integer quotient. Any fractional part is discarded, or what we call truncated. So there's no rounding that actually is done. So these are the arithmetic operators, plus, minus, <clears throat> multiplication, division, modulus. Arithmetic expressions in C++ must be entered onto the computer in straight line form. Expressions such as a divided by b must be written as a divided by b so that all constants, variables, and operators appear in a straight line. Parentheses are used in C++ expressions in the same manner as an algebraic statement. What they're saying with straight line form is that you're not going to get something like uh, a f something that actually looks like a fraction like x over y or something like that. For example, um, to write to multiply a times the quantity b plus c, okay, that's actually off a little bit, um, you're going to write a times and then b plus c in parentheses, just like you would regular math. So that expression will return whatever the uh, value is. So b plus c, even though the plus symbol's precedence is less than the multiplication symbol, the multiplication symbol's precedence, uh, according to op uh, order of operations, is less than parentheses. So we do what's in the parentheses first, b plus c, 
let's say it's 2 times 3, or 2 plus 3, we have 5, and then let's say a is 4, so then we get 4 times 5, and then that's 20. C++ applies the operators in arithmetic expressions in a precise sequence determined by the following rules of operator precedence, which are generally the same as those followed in uh, algebra. So this gives you basically the, uh, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, order of operations type information, except modulus is included as well, as, an, as a multiplicative or division uh, type uh, operation. There's no arithmetic operator in C++ for exponentiation, so x squared is represented as x times x. Um, as an algebra, it's acceptable to place unnecessary parentheses in an expression to make the expression clearer. These are called redundant uh, parentheses. So, if you had this whole thing, this takes you uh, through and shows you how to do uh, the second degree polynomial evaluation. Uh, decision making, which I believe we get to um, in a couple weeks when we do control structures. This is just giving you kind of an introduction. We have the if statement, which allows a program to take alternative action based on whether a condition is true or false. If the condition is true, the statement in the body of the if statement is executed. If it's false, the body is not executed. <clears throat> so conditions in an if statement can be formed by using the equality operators and relational operators summarized in figure 212. These are the uh, collectively known as the relational operators, equality operators for uh, determining uh, two items are equal, you actually have to put the double equal symbol, so you type equal symbol twice. Uh, notice very carefully, these are the mathematical operators that we would generally write in math, and then these are their C++ equivalent. And then here's some sample code and what does it actually mean. Okay. Following example uses six if statements to compare two numbers input by the user. If the condition in any of these if statements is satisfied, the output statement associated with that if statement is executed. So here's the example they give you. You have uh, CN to number, and then number two, reads two integers from the user, and then it says if number one is equal to number two, print out that they're equal. If they're not equal, print out they're not equal. Um, one less than the other, print out the less. So this can print out more than one thing because these are these if statements are not actually connected they're going to be evaluated separately so if you type in like they did here 3 and 7 it's going to print out 3 is not equal to 7 because they're not equal 3 is less than 7 which is true and also 3 is less than or equal to 7 which is also true so 12 and 22 and then they also did uh, 7 and 7 <clears throat> so it shows you what the code does Using declarations eliminate the need to repeat the standard prefix we did earlier in the program. Each if statement has a single statement in its body and each body statement is indented. In chapter 4 we'll show you how to specify if statements with multiple statement bodies by enclosing the body in a pair of braces. Okay. Um, also, placing a semicolon right after the right of a if statement is uh, not good, you're going to get a compiler error. These are the equality and relational operators. Again, um, you uh, have the precedence and associativity. Are they associated left to right, right to left, etc.? And then it explains the grouping or the type. All right. So that's pretty much what I have for you this week. I would recommend uh, reading through chapters 1 and 2, especially focusing on chapter 2. Um, if you're pretty solid on the uh, stuff that goes on in a regular computer program, I would um, recommend going over the uh, supplemental material that I posted. And I will also be posting this video shortly, obviously. And you'll uh, watch this at your leisure. Um, don't be too leisurely about it because you want to actually make sure that you get stuff done um, and actually are caught up with what's going on in the course. But I do recommend reading through, at least skimming through the chapter. I know they're big chapters, so I understand that. Um, all right, so if you have any questions, please email me at jpbaugh at um, oaklandcc.com.
jpbaugh.edu, jpbaugh.oaklandcc.edu. Thanks, and have a great week.